We talked with, uh, um, and if that was one part of counterculture, kind of people who were involved with technology then, who kind of led to what they see was a technological revolution in um, generating greater freedoms, that the other part of counterculture in the 60s were the people on the new left, um, who were the people who were the most proactive in terms of um, anti-war protests uh, and, and pr producing the very types of coalitions between um, divergent um, political interests in order to create uh, a transformative uh, political position. And, and that idea of resistance was something, you know, in talking with people, they said, yeah, you know, we were the, we were the ones that were politically involved and that's, we're different than the counterculture people who kind of bought into technology. And, and you know, their take on, on the 60s was, you know, resistance, that's what we were being resistant and it didn't work, you know, there, there was a war. Uh, and it did happen, and, and a lot of the disillusionment about being resistant to the war um, was something that then broke down those coalitions that were so active then. Um, but I kind of like this idea, and, and the, you know, the thing that I think we're trying to um, say with this counterculture issue is that, yeah, counterculture, at least some of the values, has so penetrated mainstream culture, and that's something that we should be aware of and be alerted to and, and take as a cautionary tale. But I think, you know, at the same time, in a kind of Dali sense, that you could think of things that are maybe were countercultural that have infiltrated um, mainstream culture that everyone kind of accepts as being uh, uh, mainstream culture. But those things could be kind of, uh, you know, wild hairs, like weird things that um, that um, sort of like false facts. Uh, and that the more of those things that infiltrate mainstream culture, the better. So it kind of does away with the idea of a kind of resistant politics of one of either being countercultural or not, or of being disappointed that somehow uh, a kind of mainstream culture has co-opted the, the alternative. It, it seems like what, what like a, a project of counterculture could be is simply generating more and more ideas, uh, the wackier the better, mm -hmm. and, and the sooner that they get infiltrated into mainstream culture and get accepted, like potentially the more damage they can do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, Deleuze says somewhere, soon we shall regard surveillance as the good old days. Right. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, it's, I think, I mean, I, I, for me, the, this is not the interesting moment. Um, the interesting moment was, was in, immediately after the countercultural phase, if we can say that, in, in, in architecture, just thinking of our own world for a bit, um, in which all of the work that we're talking about was it is as if it never happened. Immediately, around the middle 70s, all of this work disappeared. And it was not denounced, and it was not rejected, and it was not put into footnotes. It is as if it never had happened. So the, the you know, rise of interest in, in, in you know, Italian rationalism, the, the, the beginning of postmodernism, all of this, all of that goes on. And there's a, such a severe forgetting so, or, or disavowal, but it doesn't even take the form of disavowal because there is no negation. It just simply uh, vanishes. And, and so even if we make the argument, which, I, which I'm inclined to, which says that, that counterculture is a research R&D division of dominant culture, and, and, and that actually that it nevertheless it is so vital to dominant culture that it actually does offer avenues for transgressive practice because it's not a token gesture. It's a, it's a, there's a real stream feeding into dominant culture that's coming from what's defined as counterculture. Um, the absolute disappearance, which would be the, you know, which, ha which could be, you could do the analysis. I mean, it, 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 it could be analyzed in psychoanalytical terms. Like, so is, is the degree of shame so great? That it can't even be mentioned, and if that's the case, you know, sy symptomatically that seems to be the case. It's, you, you can't even refer to the unfortunate '60s or the experiments of the '60s or the embarrassments. They simply don't exist. Um, so you can read magazines like uh, Oppositions, which start to, you know, from 1972 on, you know, play a pretty dominant role in the United States, and watch how the people who are doing that magazine, who are coming from England, phase out all references to the counterculture side from issue number one on. And just, just to finish the, 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 the loop here, 
if, if, the, if the disavowal is so great, if the shame is so great, or the fear is so great, then in fact that would suggest, as far as Akhtesh is concerned, the countercultural experiments really did have radical transgressive potential, so much so that even to refer to them in a footnote would cause the fear that it would be regenerate. And, the, and the, therefore the reverse could be said of today, that it may be that we are all freely discussing counterculture now because we ourselves no longer regard it as uh, a dangerous weapon and therefore it become, can become part of history in contemporary uh, is, is discussion. That, is that the sorry, case I, though? I, I just want to, sorry, one very quick, sorry, if you look at the language of post architecture, and I only mention it because I did yeah. it this morning, yeah. <laughs> um, about half of that book is about late 60s architecture. Um, there's an enormous interest in there in Drop City, Arizona, in um, uh, various other kind of experimental forms of moving temporary architecture. And I, I not disagree, but I wonder whether that, that about that disavowal, because it seems to me that both from a general popular cultural perspective, the, the, and this is the thing I was trying to say about the folklore, that the counterculture 60s had an endless an almost continual presence within popular culture. It, it's constantly returned to as the source of genuine meaning, genuine radicalism, etc. It seems to me almost impossible to get away from, such that the recent student protests in this country and protest and alternative spaces are very, very much a kind of current issue here, as well as technology. And well, but I would it's almost I impossible to talk about those yeah. occupations in various universities that have gone on over the last two months without people referring to 68. Yeah, but, in the, but yes, in the last 10 years has been the... So I'm, I would disagree with you uh, stubbornly and, and would likely lose, but I can give you a taste of what this failed attempt to resist you would sound like. <laughs> Charles Jenks is, is incapable of disavowal. Charles Jenks is the word for that which could never forget. So basically every, those books you're describing, yeah. their, their characteristic moment is a flow chart in which everything must be in the chart. Yeah, so, totally so, so, so Charles, that, yeah. and I know it's a cheap <laughs> trick on my part, but Charles can, can never represent the shame of the field. He's a man with no shame. Uh, that's his great strength, right? <laughs> so everything is included, but rendered um, part of the flowing river. So it's just a, a, a river. For example, DIY. I mean, ad hocism and all of that. I mean, Charles will be saying that you cannot name, I mean, to exaggerate my point, you simply cannot name anything that's ever happened in architecture which was not central to one of Charles' books, but not just one of them, every one of them, <laughs> right? And this is the beauty of Charles. This is the, the, the breathtaking brilliance of Charles is the inability to, dis to display evidence of censorship, right? It just, there's a promiscuity there which, which is uh, phenomenal. But, the last, but the, in, in, the, in these last 10 years when, when countercultural experiments become the subject of articles, exhibitions, PhDs, and so on, I don't know, again from a kind of psychoanalytics of the discipline point of view, whether that's because we no longer feel any mm. challenge there, or a less negative kind of reading, that there is, for example, a profound synergy at work. For, for example, Detroit is, it, it doesn't simply resemble Street Farm Proposal, it's quite literally the project, because, and it's quite literally Bucky Fuller's argument that architecture is agriculture, since what's happening there is they're not replanting the people, the, the infrastructure and so on, and immediately uh, vast <coughs> parts of Detroit have turned into farmland without any decision being made. Nobody said, let's farm. It has become farmland. So in a certain sense, it could be that the, that the sort of academic digestion of, of counterculture is, is just resonating with the fact that so many of those experiments are now the reality of today. Right? But there's also another possibility that, the, that we left behind in the disavowal, we came to the other side of the disavowal, having actually left behind that which was most frightening to the discipline, that which was least architectural about counterculture. Is there a thing that actually architecture is the, the problem in the sense that you can only have a kind of alternative once you um, disassemble the city? Right. The, the city is the issue that um, you know, Detroit becomes radical because the city's disappearing. And you know, that, that, that question about it's the radical lifestyle we one that moved away from the city, that abandoned kind of urbanism in some sense. That seems to be a, a kind of incredibly strong yeah, right. component of, of a lot of countercultural work and that you know you get rid of you need to get rid of architecture. It 
you know, that the Rainer Banham in his own house is there's no architecture anymore, there's just you, the rock, some technology. Hi fi system, yeah. The hi fi system and the cigar. Yeah. That diagram that James uses yeah. to work everything in it comes from Rolling Stone and was used to show the connection between all the rock groups in California. Oh, I didn't know that. And he picked that up. <laughs> Oh. It has to oh, that's a great piece of information. Because his first <laughs> one is in that, in an essay called Architecture 2000. <coughs> then it's used in the book Architecture 2000. Yeah. Yeah. So that's he's recycling. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the gang that took over oppositions were never counterculture. You know, Frampton and that, mm. and that gang were never, never anywhere near counterculture in this country. But, but, but the, uh, yes, but the, the, and they're not just, they're, but they're not even counter counterculture. In other words, it's as if it didn't happen. Yeah. It just, it's just, mm. it's just a non-existent. I think, it didn't, I think it's true. That they the, believed it didn't the happen. Smithsons and Sterling, and Colin Rowe, are are passed through the filter, but everything else is is, is blocked out. And part of it, I think, is sh I think it is some some sense of shame, in the sense that there is a thought that. Um, Architects were indulgent in the 60s, and there was real pleasure there. And I think there's a sort of uh, 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 an embarrassment about the fact that architects were laughing and promiscuous intellectually, architecturally, technologically. There was huge promiscuity, and that that is unforgivable. And what what emerges in its place is a series of new dogmas that are all little mini religions, whether it be the Italian one or the American one, and so on. But all of them have as their core the idea of new rules, new regulations, yeah. new clarity. And of course, like all new architectural theories, those new rules turn out to be the ancient rules of the way architecture has always been done. So basically, the, 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 the powerful anxiety that surrounds the countercultural experiments by those that then became the dominant figures, that anxiety, it seems to me, needs to be, to be, uh, be analysed. I mean, I think in a sense, the point Fred's making, I mean, is that in some sense, and it, I think it's a characterization which is wider than architecture in the 60s, what you might call the cultural conservatives were politically Marxist mm. to some mm. extent. Mm. Well, just to say Peter Cook should be mentioned in this situation because he was the ringmaster of it all, um, and uh, globally. Not a man of the left, one wouldn't think, yeah. um, <laughs> increasingly so, but, uh, uh, but uh, nevertheless, um, he, was the, he was the one who made everybody dance, and the dance continued. Now, I'll say that. I heard Prime Minister Fuller say in London, at, at one of his endless lectures, I mean, if he, why was, if he was counterculture, why was he so fucking popular? That's all. That's all was puzzled to me. But, um, and I can remember him. I think because right, if, uh, if you didn't, you know, he was easily digested. Actually, you know, if you didn't read the books, you know, and yeah, he's pretty easily digested. He's very unchallenging. If you look at his projects now, you can begin to um, you can begin to see what they are. They, they are projects for a totally pacified world, a totally pacified world, a uniculture, and that uniculture is is, uh, is American. Um, I can remember saying here in uh, in in Redline Square, he said, uh, "Exploitation mustn't be a word in your vocabulary." And I thought, uh, you know, people who try to exclude words or destroy words are wrong. <laughs> Rule number one. Wrong. wrong. Yeah. yeah. Wrong. I, I thought and, not to, and not, to, you know, not to allow the word exploitation. Just one more thing, yeah. Peter. Sorry. 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 And just in the same room, someone who disappeared in the hill, Stuart Knight, mm. who was uh, an enormous intelligence. 
um, and the man of the letter read all his books and we had a bucky celebration here with James Mallow and Keith Critchlow mm -hmm. and, I, and, and Tony Gwilliam. Yeah, and three about three, the three sort of Carmdale boys yeah. in that corner. And still it was packed and everybody and that sort of Bucky, oh Bucky wow, Bucky wow, you know. What do you say? Awesome. You know, we all wow, Bucky wow. And still came into the back of the hall and he started up and he destroyed them, just destroyed them. And it, to the point that one of them, I think Critchlow said, Oh, he says, he says, you're taking Bucky too seriously. You know, like, oh, yeah. Oh. yeah, not a smart response. Yeah, I just wanted to say about the rules thing, you know, about not being able to run the summer school. Um, it's obviously a very, it's obviously a preoccupation of all parents that their children shouldn't be interfered with by strangers. But it's the kind of thing that you can't control with regulations and laws. Um, and that's, the problem is not the desire to protect your child, but the introduction of the law to deal with it, rather than actually the growth of trust between people. And my, my, one of the things that I did do in the, in the 70s was that I happened to be at Greenham Common Peace Camp, which was against the cruise missiles, when the women decided it was going to be a woman-only camp. And the reason for that was because there were three blokes living in a teepee, which also ought to be a symbol of the counterculture, who the only thing they ever did was to get up early enough to get the postman on the way in, open all the mail, take all the cash out, and leave all the checks. And, and actually all they needed to do, these women, there were a lot of women, there were very few men, there were these three guys, was to go to these three guys and say, actually, we don't want you to live here because you're nicking all the bread. But instead, they passed a rule, a law, which said, no more men. Now, it had a very interesting unintended consequence in that actually it made the movement very strong. And made, I would say, it's one of the successes of the counterculture, if you like, that they actually stopped the deployment of cruise missiles. I mean, they still deployed them, but by the time they deployed them, they knew they wouldn't use them. But the corollary of this story is that about a month, about a, six months after that incident, I wanted to take my TV to another peace camp outside Fairford, which is a bomber base in Gloucestershire. And I phoned up the organiser and said, is it all right if we bring the TP? And he, there was a bit of an awkward silence. And then he said, well, the thing is, actually, Pete, we've got a rule about teepees. You're not allowed, we're not allowing teepees. And I said, oh, why is that? And he said, well, we had these three guys. And they just lived in their teepee and they nicked all the money. So we decided to ban teepees. <laughs> and that's what happens. That's what happens with rules and regulations. And, and so you, th that's the problem with states. They are run by rules and regulations. And actually, they don't work. They're inefficient and they don't work. And we all feel the suppression of them. Did you advise him to get a job as a planner? <laughs> uh, no, he was um, an architect. Um, no, I advised him to, to um, revisit the problem. <laughs> Does any work where we could take another comment, or perhaps we're moving towards the end, we should go have some tea or something. Uh, tea sounds good. Would you like <laughs> to just, I mean, I'll, I'll just say something after you, but you'd like to just. Um, uh, thank you very much for, for being here, and especially Graham and Peter, really appreciate you, you coming a long way to, to be here, and it was amazing to see the film and the, the stills of the, the publication, and I hope, uh, the, the publication gets more and more exposure. We're, we're going to do a volume on. Do you still have Mar the film of the of the project? Okay, well, I'm sorry. London project. That what? Do you still have the film of the of your AA project? Well, the eight um, millimeter. We may have, we may have some of it, and we also have, we may have a copy of a, a BBC television program that we made, which was called. Which was an open um, access job. You know, uh, open access. Uh, I, I, I have got a copy of that. I foolishly didn't bring it up. 
I thought you were part of Lydia's got a copy. Yeah, yeah. I gave Lydia a copy, so I, I, and I, yeah, in my confusion, thought you, you would have it. You were part of Lydia's but, um, mob, whatever you call it. Um, no, it should be the other way around. We should be so saying Lydia. I mean, isn't Lydia near you? Yeah, she's great. I, I, I only lent her that day. You wouldn't. She's in the university. I live in a little village in Spain. You know, I mean, you know, so I said, you can copy this easier than me, surely. And yeah, you know, so get her to do two copies and she can send mine back. Okay. She's um, got a special picture on the front. Yeah, yeah. That is some info. Yeah. But yes, there's some. So that exists. There's there's three. In the slideshows. Do you get the slides of the slideshows or not? Well, we've got. Uh, no. You've got. You've seen what we've got in in from the raw state. Yeah. I well, actually, yeah, yeah. Uh, the um, the open door has got slideshows in it, hasn't it? And some really bad animation. And. Uh, <laughs> Maybe yes. and some and some very and strange some terrible shots. editing. Some terrible <laughs> editing. It was a disaster. It, we had to we had to do it live as it was being as the program was being broadcast. So there was a it was a great shot of Bruce standing in a field digging, <laughs> and behind him there was supposed to be a back projection of a motorway. So of course it's just the blue sheet because you, they used the blue sheet then to hide the background. So there's just Bruce digging in front of a blue sheet for some reason. <laughs> Not very apparent, wrong soundtrack. Yeah. And the noise of Bruce going berserk in the control room where he beat the controllers up. That didn't help a lot. But well, <laughs> um, last night, Mark was celebrating failure. Now we're celebrating <laughs> disaster. <laughs> uh, this is can only get better. Um, <laughs> I'd like to thank you very much for coming. It's been, I, I think everyone would agree, an extremely interesting afternoon and a very great pleasure. Uh, personally, I, I think actually the, the topic that might be conceptually and historically revisited is the farm. Mm. You know, because mm. it, it's very often, it, people completely fail, I think, to understand its pr productivity. Mm. Uh, otherwise, I suppose we really ought to dedicate the afternoon uh, to those who, in Fred Scott's inimitable words, have vanished into the hills. Thank you. <laughs>